Unbelievable. The government have opened up a new front on the war with landlords, and this time it's targeting the serviced accommodation sector. So in this video, I'm going to look at the momentum shift that we've seen in the market over the last six months and why that's flushing out a lot of operators, as well as the two biggest threats that the industry has seen since the COVID pandemic and what you can do to avoid them. And I'm gonna end by looking at the one model that I believe everybody should be looking at to future-proof your investments and create a regulation and recession-proof cash machine. Now look, short-term lets have seen an absolute boom in popularity over the last few years as buy-to-let becomes less attractive with increased tax, increased regulation, and higher interest rates. And many have been making that switch to the Wild West of Airbnb. And of course, as with any shiny penny, the trainers, courses, and glossy sourcing agents promising quick riches inevitably follow. But with many operators seeing a sudden squeeze and fall in booking since the back end of 2022, and with whispers of an apocalyptic Airbnb bus spreading around hosts facing empty calendars, stiff competition, and tumbling earnings, are we now seeing the fall of short-term accommodation in the context of a wider economic slowdown? But the hand wringing over a downturn ignores a conflicting but undeniable reality. The short-term accommodation sector is bigger than ever, and some operators operators are thriving like never before. According to AirDNA, the European short-term rental market saw a surge in demand of 24.1% year-on-year in March 23. So rather than a collapse, I believe we're seeing an increasingly split state of the market. Bust for some, but massive boom for others. Now this to me is a clear sign that we've hit a turning point, and if you're currently operating serviced accommodation, or you're thinking of making the switch, it has never been more important to understand how the market is evolving. Not just so you can make better decisions and stay in that boom camp, but also how you can sidestep the inevitable regulation that's going to creep in as the government look to take their slice of the pie. Because there can be no doubt that we're at war with the politicians right now. But as an entrepreneur, there's always a route that we can take to enable us to adapt and thrive. And so I'd like to ask you a favor right now and like this video to enable us to get this message out to the people who need to hear it most. And I also wanna hear your point of view on this. So in the comments below, please put your thoughts on the proposals to regulate the service accommodation sector and how it's going to affect all of us. Now, before we dive into these proposals, I want to zoom out and have a look at what's been going on in the market over the last few years. Now, in March 2020, when the pandemic hit, the future of the short-term rentals market looked grim. Many wondered if home sharing and short-term accommodation was even going to be a thing following the pandemic. And I know a lot of operators who sold on their portfolios. But not only did Airbnb and its competitors survive, since then they have flourished. Encouraged by a soaring demand and record low interest rates, investors have jumped into the market, buying up stock in attractive areas and marketing them for tourists, travelers and contractors. But the deluge of new listings has caused a inevitable correction. Now, another recent Air DNA report has shown that as inflation has ticked up and the post-pandemic frenzy has died down in some areas, an oversupply has left hosts fighting for visitors. And let's face it, the supply shocks during the pandemic were like anything we've ever seen before and totally threw out of balance the supply and demand curve. Now, as a serviced accommodation host myself, I wanted to really crunch the data because as always, there's going to be variations between the US and Europe, Europe and the UK, even different areas in the UK and different types of property. And before we crunch these numbers, it's important to note that Air DNA, which is the source, only covers data from Airbnb and VRBO, and so therefore maybe doesn't give a snapshot of the entire market. Now, it could be argued that it's skewed towards the holiday space and therefore misses niches like remote workers or contractors. However, analyzing the data that was released in January, we can see that the picture in the UK is of a balanced state where supply is only slightly above demand. Fast forward to March, and we can see that the UK is established in balanced growth. So yes, we can see over the last year in the UK that there's been a huge increase in supply, but the demand has actually outpaced this, proving that we can't be in a bus and actually the market is completely splitting. Now, as an investor, your decision should always be driven by data. And one of the aims of this channel is to make sure that all the data in the right context is presented as simply and easily for you to make those decisions with. So if you want to stay on top of it, I recommend you subscribe now to the channel to make sure you don't miss the signals which will drive those decisions. Now, without a doubt, in some areas, especially tourist ones, listings have multiplied almost unchecked, and this sets the stage for an oversupply which can bite investors. And in these areas, there is a concern in government that local families are being pushed out of the housing market. And with the levelling up programme being a key government policy as we run into a next election, there's no way they're going to want to look like they're pushing families out of their homes. However, regardless of their approach, most 
towns, cities and areas can't afford to lose the income that comes from the short-term accommodation sector. And so it follows there's an opportunity for the government to take a slice of this pie for themselves. And that leaves them with a decision to make. Accept the boom and bust cycle of the wild west of the short-term market or craft rules that are there to try and keep everybody happy. And so this takes us to the current consultation that the government have launched, which is running from now until the 6th of June 23. Now I've linked to the consultation in the description. And if you are in service to accommodation or looking to get into it, you're going to have to read this because it will affect you. But I also want to summarize the key points here in the video. Now, the main aim of the consultation is to investigate a registration scheme for all short term lets. Now, in a recent call for evidence on this, a survey of 4000 respondents showed that 60 percent supported further intervention by the government. 42 percent supported a registration scheme. And interestingly, 18 percent of people supported a full licensing scheme. Now, those who supported a registration scheme called for light touch and low cost. So I want to relate this to similar schemes we see in the HMO space. And if you're not familiar with the term, an HMO is a house in multiple occupation, which is various people living under the same roof. Now, there has been a registration scheme for HMOs for some time, but only for those which require a mandatory license which are HMOs with five or more tenants. Now, I do know that in the HMO world, a lot of people get confused between planning and licensing and also the different types of licensing that are available for local government. So let's keep it simple. Licensing is for housing standards and planning is for the use of a building. Now, for any HMO with five or more tenants, it has to have a mandatory license, which basically means you have to pay a considerable fee to your council and they'll come and inspect it to ensure compliance with amenities and housing standards. So to clarify the data in the call for evidence, the support was for a registration scheme, not a licensing scheme. Now, personally, after working in the HMO sector for 15 years, I find it difficult to see one without the other. So if we do go down the registration scheme, I'm pretty sure we'll see some form of licensing as well, but we'll just have to wait and see on that one. Now, running along this consultation is a separate consultation which concerns the planning use of short-term lets. In my eyes, this is going to be a much bigger factor. So the proposal is to create a new use class called C5 with permitted development rights to take a C3 building, which is a normal residential, and use it as a C5 short-term accommodation. Now, this is very similar to what they've done in the HMO space, which is to create a new use class called C4, and permitted development rights exist to take C3, a residential building, to C4, which is an HMO with up to six tenants. However, by creating a new use class, even if it has permitted development rights, it gives local government a mechanism that they can control planning, and that's called Article 4. Simply put, in certain areas, local government could put an Article 4 restriction in place, which removes the ability for somebody to use permitted development. And that means you'd have to submit a planning application to take a C3 residential property to C5 serviced accommodation sector. So what does all this mean for short-term operators? Well, the first thing to say is we're still in consultation. So right now, nothing has changed. But from my experience, after going through several consultations previously, the chances are that everything they put out is going to come into force, regardless of the feedback. Let's face it, those powers that be are just following a box ticking exercise to give us the facade of democracy. So let's assume that we do end up having a registration scheme and a new use class. Now, as I said previously, I don't for one moment see a registration scheme that's not going to involve us having to pay money to the government. So the chances are that at a baseline, all operators are going to have increased costs and increased scrutiny from local council. Now, this actually is not necessarily a bad thing. I support increased standards. With any new market, when we're going through that Wild West period with no regulations, we often see standards drop at the expense of operators making profits. AirDNA, again, has actually showed evidence that a lot of travelers are reverting to using hotels for the fact that Airbnbs can often be of a very mixed and dodgy standard. Now, when we saw increased regulation in the HMO market, there can be no denying that we saw a big uptick in standards. And this is a good thing for everybody, albeit it does hit profit margins. What it also does is give high quality, experienced operators a huge competitive edge against the rogues. But what about a new use class? Now, in areas where Article 4 has been used in the HMO market, we've actually seen an increase in price of established units due to the drop in supply, whereas other properties in the area that can't be converted are then devalued. For me, the issue with Article 4 is it's a case of slamming the door after the horse is bolted and is only introduced when the problem is already there. We then find ourselves in a position where families don't want to move back into oversaturated areas and landlords don't want to sell because their units command a premium. So really, Article 4 has the opposite effect to what's intended. And I suspect if we go down this 
route with surface accommodation will see exactly the same and it will bake in any supply demand issues into local areas. Now, this is also going to affect many popular training strategies right now. For example, rent to service accommodation, where people are now going to have to jump through a lot more legal hoops to actually operate. Could we find ourselves, for example, in a situation where operators have got long-term rent to rent contracts, and then they need to apply for a planning use change, which the landlord doesn't allow them to do. So look, if I was operating in the rent to SA sector or sourcing service accommodation deals, I would be zooming out and doing a massive risk mitigation exercise right now to future-proof those models. Now, amid any period of uncertainty, there is one thing that can be assured. Markets are constantly evolving, and this one is certainly growing up quickly. And it's for this reason that I've always chosen to own the underlying asset rather than operate trading strategies like rent to rent. The demand for short-term accommodation is undeniably still growing and that demand needs servicing. Look, even if we suddenly do see a, a flood of supply that overtakes demand, it doesn't mean demand suddenly drops off. It just means that those who are operating at the lower end of the spectrum will struggle to fill their properties. Faced with more choice, the discerning traveler is going to choose high quality, professionally run units over some tatty rent to rent. And this for me is where the opportunity lies right now. As this market evolves, my personal strategy is to create high end, bespoke and boutique blocks of accommodation with the right planning in place to future proof against any changes. And if you want to do the same with your asset base, I recommend you watch this video and this video.